Well, welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. We've had a little bit of hiatus, but uh, excited to jump into these conversations again. And today we're going to be talking about race, politics, religion, and mental health in America. So some heavy topics, but some important topics and really excited for two guests that I have on the program today. The first that I'd like to introduce, I'm honored to be able to welcome Professor Eddie Glaud Jr. to the Addy Hour. As many of you probably already know, Dr. Glaud is one of the nation's most prominent scholars. He's an author, a political commentator, a public intellectual, and a passionate educator who examines the complex dynamics of the American experience. Mm -hmm. Dr. Glaud is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton. He's a Morehouse graduate who also holds a master's degree in African American Studies from Temple and a PhD in religion from Princeton. Dr. Glaud is someone who is a columnist for Time Magazine. He's also a regular contributor on programs like Morning Joe, Deadline White House with uh, Nicole Wallace and Meet the Press. And he's someone who continually challenges us to examine our collective American conscience and in his words, to not to posit the greatness of America, but to establish the ground upon which to imagine the country anew. So I'm honored and thrilled to be able to welcome Professor Glaud to the Addy Hour this morning. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it as well. My next guest I'd like to introduce is none other than A.D. Lumkele Thomason, who is a speaker, poet, and an award-winning filmmaker. He's spoken around the United States and in places like Sudan, South Africa, China, and Palestine. And he's also the author of Permission to be Black, My Journey with Jay-Z and Jesus, where he acknowledges and confronts the reality of racial trauma and shares his story to give permission to readers to be Black, to be Christian, and to be the person God has made them to be. A.D. is a native of Detroit. He has more than 17 years of experience preaching and teaching the peace of Jesus in ethnically divided countries, cultures, and communities. And so I'm honored to be able to welcome A.D. to the podcast today. Thanks for being here. It's good to be here. Excited. I know we were joking offline, too. I didn't get the memo about the uh, the coordination <laughs> with the shirts. So I'm still feeling a little bit left out. But I think hopefully, you know, as we roll with this conversation, I'll feel I'll feel a sense of belonging and inclusion as well. <laughs> funny, funny. Um, just, you know, just to start out, you know, the topics obviously we're going to be talking about are, are heavy and these are topics that you all talk about on a regular basis. And I really appreciate the way both of you are uh, public scholars and have really helped us to continue to think about our history as a nation, our present and our future. Uh, but one of the things I just want to do to start out and listeners know that we often just like to check in and see how people are doing. But I'm curious, you know, with the topics that you all engage in, how do you continue to engage in those topics while also taking time to kind of watch your own emotional wellness, balance your, your time management, work-life balance, all those things? How, how, do, you, how do you do that on a, on a day-to-day basis? Uh, Dr. Glau, if we could start out with you. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, because I find myself um, having to comment almost every day mm on the state of the country, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being asked to interpret the drums as Adolf Reed would say. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in my, in my work, I talk about finding your elsewhere, mm. a place that allows you to get the requisite distance mm. from the reality of the world. And so, you know, you got to have those people who love you unconditionally. So I just, I just flew down to Memphis and hung out with my boys that I've been I've known since since my Morehouse days, mm. we all just met mm. there and just had an extraordinary time. Um, you know, I, I, I disappear into novels. I'm finishing. A, I just finished a wonderful novel by Anna, uh, Anna Burns entitled Milkman. And then I reread The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. And now I'm finishing up Sugar Bane, Sugar Bane by uh, Douglas Stewart. So, mm. you know, just kind of disappear into fiction mm -hmm. in some ways. Uh, so, you know, finding finding a respite. Um, in friends and in, in 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 novels, that's been the way my I've been keeping my head on my shoulder. That's great, and it sounds so intentional too. I mean, even the mm -hmm. time that you spend reading books, hanging out with folks, I imagine you know that takes time too. So I'm impressed that you you carve out the time for that. Do you ever get any pushback in terms of you know why are you not available for this and that? Mm -hmm. Or I mean, how how have you navigated that? Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody, you know, once you once you acquire a certain kind of public standing, mm -hmm. that you know, everybody thinks that they. That everyone's asking for your time. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to be uh, very deliberate about mm -hmm. uh, being able, being able to carve out your own time and being able to cultivate the capacity to say no. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed a, 
you know, because I'm the chair of a department, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm public, you know, I'm traveling around the country, I'm doing television, I'm writing. I just needed, you know, you got to replenish because this is not a sprint. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a long distance <laughs> race. So you got to be able to, to at least carve out some time for yourself. So some people might be annoyed when I say no, but, but, you know, we try to say it in a, in a generous way. Like I was, like I got home training, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's so important. I think that's encouraging for others to hear too. Cause I think sometimes people look at folks like you and they're like, how do they do that? How do they bounce at all? How do they keep going? So to be able to hear kind of that behind the scenes and know there are times that you're, you're saying no and really focusing on what you need to do to stay in that place. I think it's really important. Absolutely. Doc. AD, what about you? Yeah. I mean, it's, I'll make it, I'll simplify it and just say, I try to connect with uh, nature in mm-hmm. silence. Uh, to me, silence rejuvenates me, you know, so some tangible things I, I, I'll do, I'll go fishing and turn the phone off, you know, and I, I could be out there from sun up to sundown, mm-hmm. just in my thoughts, um, 12 hours a day, I got a bow, so I do bow hunting and I'm out there doing archery and in the woods and target and and uh, it's good. It's, um, you know, I, I do read. I like film, you know, like that fiction mm-hmm. that can remind me of the possibility of what could be despite what is, you know, so aspirational things. And yeah, you got to connect with people who have a like mind, but they don't want anything from you. I mm-hmm. think that's the rare reality is finding people who don't want anything or won't turn the conversation in their favor, but they just like your presence. So that, those are probably the, the, the things that I would do. Yeah, or I do. That, that's definitely good. Is that something that you've done from the get go or were these things that you'd say you developed over time out of necessity? Definitely over time out of necessity. Um, you know, you look at different characters in, in the history from, um, you know, you take the Dalai Lama going out in creation or uh, Gandhi, King, you know, Christ himself, and you just see there's something with creation and silence, mm. you know, um, in, in like, uh, you know, we said earlier, like, you know, people will steal that time if you let them. So you have to have a discipline, a muscle of saying no mm-hmm. in a kind way to replenish yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so good. I wanted to bring it home to students a little bit too, because, you know, just in my experience working with students, I mean, I'm always encouraged by their passion and how willing they are to jump into so many important topics and conversations and, and, and fights, to be honest, um, in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Um, and I see that really with the, you know, the generation coming up, but then at the same time, sometimes like you all were both talking about, I don't always see the willingness to say no. And uh-huh. so people get themselves spread really thin. Um, and especially with the emotional toll that comes with it, not always having time to kind of step back mm-hmm. and take care of themselves. Or if mental health challenges come up, really not having the tools to address those types of things. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, not even just in terms of timing, but in terms of topics, how do you all decide what topics to engage in and when to pull back and say, okay, you know, I'm passionate about this, but this is something that right now I just need to make sure I don't spread myself too thin and just go a thousand miles an hour or like pick which battles to, to, to engage in. Professor Glad, you want to, you know, I, you know, you, the temptation, in this world, particularly in the world of punditry, is that you mm. you you can speak on everything, mm. <laughs> you know. And you know, there you know, Eddie's point about silence is really really key, right? Mm. Sometimes you just have to, you know, understand that this is not your lane. Mm. You know, I could talk about this. I have I have opinions on it, but this is really not where my expertise lies. So why am I talking? <laughs> Right. Um, and so a lot of times I find myself, you know, making uh, decisions right, based upon, you know, somebody else could be somebody else might be better here. Mm-hmm. Why? Why do I need to occupy this space? Right. Open it up for someone else. Let someone else step in there. Uh, so, you know, you, I make I make decisions on the one hand, you know, around, you know, what I know. What's my value add to the conversation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How might I frame it differently? Uh, on the other hand, and then there's there's another, you know, wh- I'm not a guy who wants to talk about, you know, popular culture a lot, right? So, 
you know, I'm not the one you're going to call to talk about Jay-Z or DMX or, you know, or Cardi B. That's not, yeah. that's not my zone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you, again, knowing where you are. Right. So, so what does it mean when I'm being asked to reflect on a movie or a film or, mm-hmm. or a popular cultural event, mm-hmm. understanding where I am and trying to be consistent with who I am. Right. So I think part of it has everything to do. Both of those points have everything to do with being consistent, being trying to be consistently clear about the, about the purpose of your voice mm-hmm. and why you're speaking. What is your platform for? How does it relate to your calling? And when you, when, you, when you ask yourself those questions, then you're not pursuing opportunities in order to cultivate brand. Mm, that's good. You see, you just, because you're doing something that, has more, that is more than just simply you running your mouth. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so that becomes the basis of making, of making these sorts of choices. Cause if not, somebody asks you to talk about any, if anything, yeah. anything and everything. And, yeah. you know, you know, you know, it's this, you know, something happens to black people. What do you think black people think? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, cause yeah. you, you're the interpreter of black folk, you know, so you right. gotta be very, very, very deliberate in this, in this regard. Yeah. That's I think that's so good from the standpoint of the speaker. I'm a little bit curious because how do we, I'm curious what you think about how people should filter that as consumers in a sense, because as, as a speaker, you have control about whether you step into a conversation or not. Grand, there are a lot of people who are stepping out of their lane and still speaking into conversations. So from the receiving end, like how do we, how do we filter that and just not get taken up by everything that everyone has said about every single topic? Well, you know, this is, this is one of the challenges. I, I'll just say this really quickly and then I'll shut up, right? One of the challenges about our current moment is that there's a kind of leveling. Mm that happens, right? The kind of disappearance of expertise. Mm -hmm. And so because of social media platforms and the like, everybody can be an expert on anything Mm -hmm. and everything. And so you have to be a kind of discerning listener. And how do you, how do you absorb information? How do you, who do you uh, extend authority to, right? What Mm -hmm. material are are you drawing on in order to form your opinion? So um, I think part of what we have to do in this moment where seriousness is under attack Mm -hmm. is cultivate the habits of listening intelligently, Mm -hmm. right? Cultivate the habits of uh, acquiring um, a kind of ruthless um, uh, um, orientation to what you take in. Mm -hmm. Because as we're taking in all this information, man, Mm -hmm. we're also taking in a lot of toxins. I mean, I mean, you on Twitter for just, 15 minutes and you just kind of like, damn, I need to go brush my, I need to go take a <laughs> bath or something. Yeah. Cause it's just a lot of negativity yeah. just kind of coming at you over and over and over again. Yeah. So the, the, the implication of that leveling is that, you know, everybody thinks they know everything when mm-hmm. hardly anybody's reading in mm-hmm. these days mm-hmm. or they're reading at the surface. So you have to become a much more discerning listener yeah. uh, and choose who you're going to lend authority to yeah. as opposed yeah. to just accepting everybody's voice. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Ad, before we swing back just to your filtering, I'm just curious, you know, also in your role as a professor, because some of the topics that you teach about, you know, about human rights, decolonizing your faith, yeah. filmmaking and things like that. Are there ways that you guide your students through that filtering process? Because those topics, too, I'm, I'm assuming that you're deconstructing a lot yeah. of presuppositions as you get into that. So I feel like a lot of these topics would likely come up in the classroom for you. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a good way to say it. deconstructing people's presuppositions. Man, that is that is that is a hard task because <laughs> because when people have presupposed and concluded, mm-hmm. they'll see that in anything, mm-hmm. even if it's not there. Um, so I, I, I think people have one, they have a fear of missing out, you know, and because they have such a fear of missing out, they'll take in the toxic and the healthy. But the problem is they don't know how to distinguish between mm-hmm anymore you know so now people are becoming experts just on being up on the trash mm. right <laughs> you know that, yeah. that's a new thing whereas before in our generation we actually wanted to go to the expert because they put in the time not because mm-hmm. they were charismatic or mm-hmm. right et cetera, et cetera. so mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. lost that so what i challenge my students on is having a grind, a work ethic to dig, Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people just don't want to dig, 
they they want to they have a fear of missing out and then they don't want to dig. Mm. And when you got social media, it it gives you the best of all that. When you're lazy, <laughs> you don't want to miss out. You like I just take in whatever comes my way, right? And we know that that doesn't make a I would call an honest intellectual, uh, an honest pundit, right? It just makes one who becomes now personalities. Mm. And so that that's why I challenge them. I say, are you going to be a person or a personality? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's good. How how do students react with that? It's good. I mean, it's good. It's refreshing for them, actually, mm. you know, because um, no one no one's challenging them on that, you know. Um, I think, you know, what Eddie said earlier is good. Who you give authority to, it's almost like why why do you give your authority away so easily? Mm. <laughs> They what now? Tell me what tell me what they did. Oh, they they got a 10 time platinum record. So that's why you follow what they say on civil rights. Mm. No. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Obviously being facetious, but that's what a you gotta show them their broken philosophy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really good. Just to push on that a little bit though, I mean, I'm thinking of the flip side of that too. What do you think about you know the situations? where people are kind of sharing from their lived experience, so, you know, you know, thinking back to LeBron and the uh, just shut up and dribble type of comment. How do you, how do we balance those two sides of it? Cause I think you're right. At one hand, mm-hmm. if someone's platinum selling artist, it doesn't mean that they have put in the grind on certain mm-hmm. components, but at the same time, we have the flip side where people are just invalidating people speaking into these social issues when they should, I mean, how, how do you, what do you all think about that line? How do we, how do we balance that? All right, let me give let me give a a, a Dwayne Wade live to Eddie on this one. So I I'm not a proponent of shut up and dribble in its connotation, but I am when you haven't done the work. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because what happens is they'll give authority to a LeBron who hasn't read anything. And then millions of people start walking it out like, yeah, man, see what we got to do is we just got to say at the police, man, you know, not that LeBron said that, but when Mm -hmm. people start talking and they haven't done the actual work, then you're swaying culture in a way with that lack of work ethic. So, you know, just to pick up that, because I'm going to take it and do this with it. Um, (laughs) there, 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 There is a, you know, there are examples of courage. Mm-hmm. that abound in everyday life mm. and people who have a lot to lose when they exhibit that courage is worth lifting up. Mm-hmm. That's good. So when someone says, shut up and dribble and you, and you respond, mm. that is, that is a moment, mm-hmm. right? Where, you know, LeBron James thought more about himself as a man, mm. as a human being, than himself as a kind of product, as, right. as a basketball player. That's, that's, but, but it doesn't follow from that, right? Mm. That now LeBron or Jay-Z, for that matter, can mm. step into, you know, the, the brouhaha over, for example, the, the national anthem in the, fo- in the NFL. Mm. And suddenly, because you are a businessman and you have this, cachet that you can enter into that space and suddenly resolve Mm. everything that Colin Kaepernick was trying to do and the folk around him were trying to do. Right. So I think it's really important just to pick up on AD's point, right. That examples of courage, Mm. right. Are important. Um, But they come, it it also comes with when we Mm. talk about moving from a moment to a movement, Mm. it also requires, right. A kind of depth of learning. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, and, and people are influential in a number of different areas, whether they're in sport, whether they're in acting, whether they're in the business world, um, whether there's your, there's your uncle or your aunt, folks are influential, mm-hmm. uh, but it doesn't necessarily, just because they're influential in one moment, doesn't mean that they're influential in all moments. See, that's good. You, you, you catch that? did you catch that and i and i'm a again i'm gonna do another move i'll pass it back (laughs) and and here here's what i think people miss in in what he's saying we don't pass the ball to the right person anymore we assume Mm. we're supposed to take the shot Mm. right Mm. you see what i'm saying so 
if if I know Eddie has put in this work and they ask him something on politics, I go, yeah, I can give insightful, but I go, nah, I'm going to pass it to him. And mm-hmm. we don't see people in those platforms have the right relationships to pass to the right person mm-hmm. or at least be mentored by the right person that they should be passing to. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, so my question was like, why, why is it a LeBron being mentored by the Eddie Galas in the world to when they ask him that question, he's like, bam, I know what to. Right. Well, you know, I, I would, I would hope that he has some folks in his camp. <laughs> I pray that he does. But, you know, I think I think it's really I think that's a really important point. It goes back to something I said earlier, A.D., um, and, and that, that that, you know, the temptation is to hog the mic. Yeah, mm-hmm. It is that you that, you know, you think you can just because you got it, you're supposed mm-hmm. to speak on everything. That's mm-hmm. good. And, the, and the discipline, the spiritual discipline, actually, to actually be quiet mm-hmm. and pass the mic is something that we have to cultivate. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Wow, no, uh, that's so true. I think the challenge is actually cultivate, getting to that point, helping people cultivate that. I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's refreshing to hear both of you espouse you know, that here. I'm just, I, I guess, I'm trying to. How does that work out practically? Let me give you an example. Let me give you a crack practical mm-hmm. example. Bob Moses, God bless his soul. You know, the, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for. Mm-hmm what Bob Moses did in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a country boy from Moss Point, Mississippi. SNCC was in Moss Point. Mm. Uh, Hollis Watkins, I mean, Stokely Mm. Carmichael, all these folk. Mm. Um, And Miss Ella Baker told the SNCC folk, Mm -hmm. you know, shut up and listen. Maybe you might learn something. Mm. Mm -hmm. As they were organizing sharecroppers. Mm. And so Bob's orientation was to enter into spaces and create the conditions under which indigenous leadership would emerge. Because he was saying, we are the leaders we've been looking for. And so at the heart of his politics is a politics of tending, Mm. tending to the person right in front of you, Mm. tending to the situation right in front of you, which means you have to have the habits of listening. You have to be perceptive. You have to be empathetic, all of these things. So at the heart of SNCC, Mm. as an civil rights organization, Mm -hmm. right, is moving into spaces that people thought were at the margins of American democratic Mm -hmm. life, Mm -hmm. right, and creating the conditions under which a Fannie Lou Hamer could emerge. Mm -hmm. Come on. You see what I mean? So so part of what we have to do, oftentimes in 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 this culture, in this moment now, Mm -hmm. we're so preoccupied with our own individual brands. We're Mm -hmm. so preoccupied with projecting Or as we would say, getting something on consignment so we can then get our hustle. Come on. Oh, I, I'm going to I'm going a little too deep. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> <You're good. laughs> give me, give me this so then I can do this. And you know, so because we all want to get in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Not understanding what really what we're trying to do really is change the game entirely. Mm-hmm. And that's going to require uh, not folk getting out front necessarily, mm-hmm. uh, but all of us kind of creating the conditions under which each and every other person can become the fullest human being that they're called to be. Mm-hmm. If yeah. that makes sense. No, yeah. sure. So, to, uh, so to answer your question directly, because I, 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 right, he wants he want, <laughs> he wants some tangibles. I guess I, I can see the neuroscience in his brain. He's like, man, I yeah. need some ten steps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can't hide you, it. <laughs> you, you, you know, I I think we've been fortunate to know our story, to look at our story. What are some resonating themes? So, I, I if if I would say something to people, I'd say, write out your story. Where did you grow up? Mom, dad, what's their story? Siblings, no siblings. The environment, if you fortunate college, you know, master's, doctorate, write out and you'll start to see things. Mm. And going back to uh, Eddie's point earlier, when you see those things, you will know what you're supposed to be saying yes to. Mm. And the problem is people don't know the theme of their life. So for me, my theme is storytelling, integrity, and fighting for those who are oppressed. Mm. Those are my themes. So I know what to say yes to, and I know what to say no to. I know what to pass, pass to, even if someone gives me the opportunity, I'm going to pass, right, and recommend someone else. I think a lot of people don't know themselves, and I would even say this. 
a lot of people may know themselves. They want to be something else mm. because of mm. the glory that may come with it. So now mm. we're talking about humility. You see mm. what I'm saying? Everybody, mm. you know, it's funny when people read like things on MLK or things on like the Gandhis or the, you know, even Christ himself. They always read themselves as MLK, Gandhi. Christ. They never read themselves as a secondary, third or the person on the mm. side of the road. But, but a lot of us, may be the onlooker who's trying to get the courage to be that person. And that's okay. Mm. <laughs> it's okay if you're the tiller and the one who plants the seed and never brings in the harvest, but your work matters. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, two themes I'm hearing coming out from both of you, just community and, and purpose. So, you know, as you're talking about just tending to the people and the building the community, and here comes the neuroscience, Ada, you, you, you pulled it out. But <laughs> just the importance of that for our brains in general. Yeah. And what yeah. that does, I mean, people talk a lot about oxytocin and other things that we have when we're in community and social interactions with others and how that helps us get to a place of peace and how it makes us more effective in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then AD, as you're bringing out just all the aspects of purpose mm -hmm. and how that guides what you say yes to, what you say no to. I mean, I think those, those pieces, both of those are really important and critical guiding pieces for people moving forward. And, you know, you know with the theme of the podcast too, all those tie into mental health. So all the pieces that you're bringing up, if those are lost, that's when people start to, to get frayed in a sense, because everything we're talking about, I mean, all these people, they're, they're emotionally heavy, they're taxing. I mean, Ada, you've written about the racial trauma, you've talked about that quite a bit as well. And when we don't have that community and that purpose, I think it's that much easier for those challenges to emerge and then to people, again, to lose track of really being centered and having that place and those tools. Because, you know, I mean, this is, it sounds like a cliche, but when people spread themselves too thin and don't attend to themselves and they can't help anybody else, if they're not in a place of wholeness themselves. And that's not to say that we have to be completely whole to engage, but we can't ignore it, obviously, and, and yeah. think that we're going to be effective in other people's lives. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I, we, you know, I have this view that, you know, we're, all of us inevitably will lose our way. Mm. Mm. It's just what it means to be human, you know? Mm, that's good. The temptations will be what they are. And, you know, the thing is that, you know, passing the mic is hard when people are giving it to you mm. over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trying to anoint you, trying to make you the spokesperson, make you the, you know, mm. always that article, the, not A, but the, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when you lose your way, because mm -hmm. you will, Mm -hmm. The question is, what do you have to recalibrate, to recenter? Mm -hmm. I like that. And so I'm a mama's child. <laughs> I'm Juanita Glaude's child. Juanita had her first baby in the ninth grade. She was cleaning toilets for a living, mm -hmm. then became a supervisor of, of the janitorial crew at the Ingalls Shipyard. Bill, right. So whenever I lose my way, I have something to recenter, to recalibrate. Mm. Who am I in relation to? that representative, that representation of value yeah, is good. at the core of who I am. So when people don't have the ability to recalibrate, yeah. that's when they become dangerous. You see? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think this, cause you know, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of wholeness. That's good. You know, I'm skeptical. You know, I, I, I use the analogy of Katsugi uh, pottery, you know, mm -hmm. that Japanese pottery where, you know, you can have a crack, it's mm. a cracked piece of pottery, right? Mm. But they fill it with gold. Mm. The crack doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. So the crack pot is actually more valuable than mm. the original version. So I don't like to aspire for wholeness. I'm, mm. I'm, I want to find beauty in my brokenness. Because mm. you see, does that make sense? I'm yeah. speaking to the neuroscientists yeah. now. So, yep. but I'm trying to. You're good. I'm, You're good. Okay, all right. All right. Hey, you see, I'm going to back up yeah. off that with that. Like, I'm going to leave it alone because he's like, let me, let me break this down. For no, you're good. I mean, and everything that comes from, from the pain, too. Exactly. Of moving yeah. forward. Because I mean, we always talk about that with broken bones, but there are ways that that happens with our brains, too. I mean, there are all the, the processes and developmental processes we go through. And, you know, people like to throw around the word plasticity, but just the changes that can happen in our brains when we go through certain circumstances. Some of that plasticity can happen through yeah. painful circumstances. Right. And yeah. it's, it's an ongoing process. It happens with the good things, it happens with the bad things, and that all gets us to the place where we are now. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that we avoid the pain. And I mean, if we're thinking in terms of psychology, that's kind of that cliche of avoid avoidance. 
So if you have to deal with something, you need to deal with it and move through it. If you avoid mm -hmm. it, it's just going to fester. And so you have to, I mean, there's, there's pain that comes with that. There's brokenness that comes with that, but we get to a stronger place of healing on the other side. We learn those skills. So yeah. I'll give you that, uh, that neuroscience validation for you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Eddie, were you going to, were you going to uh, respond there too? Before I, no, I pulled just, the neuroscience hand. I, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> just double click and, and, <laughs> and say that, you know, that personality generation, you know, looking to be a personality, mm. they don't show the cracks and the flaws. Mm. And so we we really basically follow in a bunch of personalities, really people who don't display their humanity. And we're wondering why we feel more depressed or more stressed out because, and this is where it gets into filmmaking for myself, we're imitating a false reality, mm. you know? And so we, we, we want to challenge people to, tell honest stories about vices and virtues and only follow those things that are honest in their vices and honest in their virtues. So mm. even if you see me do something virtuous, don't assume inside a hundred percent, I was clear from mm. not trying to come up. Right. <laughs> it's, it's always a wrestle, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I like that, you know, somebody is too whole, you know, it's like we say in the street, if somebody, is is so perfect. It's like, man, I can't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 You know, I wanted to kind of loop back into this this idea too. You know, hey, just everything that you've done around, you know, with your studying and reading and teaching on James Baldwin and not not in a um not in a downplaying way, but the messiness of everything that he went through. Mm -hmm. it's not pain-free. I mean, you know, all the challenges that you talked about, the intersection of just the mental health challenges and the activism. And I just wonder if you could elaborate on just what you've learned in that journey, even, at, even as you've been talking about this challenge of wholeness and the cracks. And as we talked about the neuroscience of importance of walking through pain, what, what has that journey been like for you in terms of understanding from history, what others have had to go through even to try and affect change? You know, when I was working on my book on Bal uh, Begin Again uh, with Baldwin, um, you know, the sentences initially didn't dance. Mm. And I remember hearing Jimmy say something in my head, you know, well, if we're going to do this together, old boy, you're going to have to deal with you. Mm. And so I had to, I had to go back and deal with the fact that I'm still, you know, uh, I still got daddy issues mm. that I'm still this, this wounded little boy. And once I started grappling with, you know, my own relationship with my father, the sentences started jumping. Mm. So Baldwin says, you can't run away from your fear. You got to run towards it. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a sign of maturity. Yeah. And what he's saying is that the messiness of American life is actually a reflection of the messiness of our interior lives. Mm. So that unexamined life, to use Socrates' uh, you know, dictum, the unexamined life isn't worth living, mm. right? But the unexamined life also generates a world, you know, that puts us all in peril. Mm. And so part of what I learned, because Jimmy was always on the verge of disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, he tried to commit suicide twice. Mm. He was drowning himself in alcohol. Mm. I barely survived writing the book because he was demanding so much of me. Mm. Mm. And it wasn't until... I'll say this. It wasn't until I saw, I read it. I saw an exchange between him and Nikki Giovanni. Oh my goodness. And Nikki Giovanni AD. And Jimmy was, Jimmy's Baldwin at this point. And Nikki Giovanni is a young sister, up and coming poet. And she was like, Baldwin was talking about, you know, black men having to go to work and da 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 and come home. Yeah. And she says, lie to me. Yes. And Baldwin's confused. <laughs> she says, lie to me. You come home and you take it out on me, lie to me. And it was in that moment, that exchange, where Baldwin's demand for a certain kind of honesty that was almost tearing my world apart, mm -hmm. right, um, came into view in a different sort of way. Nikki gave me uh, a license to hold him at arm's length to a mm -hmm. certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, Doc, a certain kind of maturity requires a confrontation mm. with who you are. Mm. 
so that you can actually release yourself into who you can be. Mm. And good. Baldwin would take that formulation and apply it to the nation. Mm. Unless you confront who you are for real, you're never going to become anything otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, so that's, that's the formulation. Yeah. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah. No, that's so good. So many parallels there. And I mean, to be honest, that's something I'm continuing to try just to, to wrestle with, you know, even the parallels, not, not to take it too far, but about the state of our country and, and how we think about mental health yeah. and that aspect of denial yeah. that's there and the challenge of addressing something when you're in denial. So, you know, I was mentioning that whole thing about avoidance. So, you know, if people are going through anxiety, the key is to not avoid getting into the situation because it's just going to get bigger and bigger and your mind is going to be that much harder to deal mm -hmm. with it the next time. And just all the parallels that, that come out between us who I haven't quite, you know, formulated it yet, but it's still, and, and you, you've been mentioning that as well, but just the danger, <laughs> just the danger that of living in that, that space. And I'm sure maybe we'll come back to that in terms of the commentary on the country too. But Eddie, I want to give you a chance to kind of respond to what all this truth that uh, Eddie's dropping <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean that that I could speak from that. First of all, the Nikki Giovanni James Baldwin interview that is like on the top five of <laughs> <laughs> just pieces that you need to consume. Mm. Uh, it was phenomenal, and like he said, with Baldwin being Baldwin and she being an up and coming, but she challenged him. Show me a lot about who she still is and who we need to be as people mm. like don't get caught up in this personality but but look at who they are is this right is this wrong does it need to be challenged mm -hmm. and i think you know going to his point we we take on so many i would say lies and deceptions that we aren't strong enough to run into the thing we feel fear most and come out and make it out on the other end mm. I can't tell you the number of people who say, yeah, man, I, I, I get what you're saying, AD, about, you know, facing the fears and you got to deal with the trauma, but I don't know if I'm going to make it on the other side. And my, and my response is, what a low view of yourself mm -hmm. and what a low view of humanity that you don't believe you had a strength to make it through this pain that isn't supposed to be the marker of who you are. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I go, if I'm telling you, yo, you can actually heal from this. Yeah. But I'm used to work, w working with this, this broken arm, but you know, it can be healed and better if, if we break it. And re I get that, but I don't know if I'm gonna make it through the other side of the, the other side of the pain. And, I'm, and a lot of times I'm thinking, wow, what, what has convinced us of that? Mm. that that's a, that's a huge presupposition. And so I'm always challenging people to be more inspired, be more uh, aspiring of themselves and to reject these, these false narratives that this, this low place or low station that we have is where we we're supposed to just survive mm. through life, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Surviving versus thriving, but it, it's not easy as you mentioned too. And just, and we'll get back to some of the, what you brought in your book too, but just yeah. all the traumas, that people go through and just all the lack of control that comes with that. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think sometimes there's a false sense of safety and not minimizing it all, but a false sense of safety and not moving forward because at least then people feel like they can control that mm -hmm. aspect versus going through to a place where they may not have control again, all the challenges that come through that. I mean, yeah. there's obviously ways that mm -hmm. trauma counselors and folks can help people through that, but I think that's a, that's a key piece as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's so important that you bring that, to people and show what is on the other side. Cause it gets back to that idea of the pain too, and how yeah. much stronger we are when we go through the pain. Yeah. I'm going to stay say, in my lane I, in the neuroscience and not try and venture out, but yeah. there, is, there is truth one to thing it. On that. <laughs> I'll say mm -hmm. one thing on that. Mm -hmm. I, I think also I, I'll speak directly to, um, you know, African American descendants of slaves. I will speak mm -hmm. directly to this. <clears throat> we downplay the fact that, we tangibly made it through what I would call some of the most hellacious, terrorizing, and inhumane, mm. tangible things. I, we, we only have to talk about the actual morality of it. I'm just talking mm. about physically. Mm. And that came to light when I was able to do this documentary in mm. Ghana, and I physically were in these places where you couldn't see 
the light of day for months on end. We're, we're talking about a different level of solitary confinement, mm -hmm. right? Are you stand there, you go, there's, there's no way there should be a physical person. We ain't even got to the boats. We're talking about the processing castles, mm -hmm. right? And then you could go before the processing castles, the 500 mile journey, and you go, we had to, we, we, our, my ancestors did this too. So when you, when you come through all that, you go, I don't know what it is. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I've been born to triumph. My people, my specific people are born to triumph. It may be Jay-Z. <laughs> we may not know what the tools are, <laughs> but I do know this. I'm born to triumph. Mm. And that's something as I as I look at us as is is brown man, I'm like, nah, I ain't believing that line. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No. For real. For real. Real talk. No. Real talk. Have you anything you want to follow up? You know, I, that I, I used, statement. Yeah, you know, I used to say to my son, I don't didn't used to say, I say it to my son all the time, and I say it to myself, the world conspires to make you small. Mm. And the question you have to ask yourself is, will you be complicit? Mm. Come on. <laughs> and if you don't, if you're not going to be complicit, then you must do like John Coltrane, take giant steps. Mm. So, good. you know what I mean? So I think. And, you know, one way to render A.D.'s point is that, you know, we all are born with the crown above our head. Man. The question is, how, will you grow into it? Mm. Will you grow into it? And part of the challenge we face over and over again is getting people to see that. Mm. Because again, the world tries to make us small. Because mm -hmm. you got some folks in the most cosmopolitan city in the world who can't see beyond their borough, mm. their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about folk in the Delta. I'm talking about folk in New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talking about folk in Chicago. Talking about folk in Los Angeles, right? So there's a sense in which to, to understand one's life as the canvas to create art, to create beauty, right? No matter the circumstance is, is a challenge, is hard to do. Um, so how do we break through that is the question, you know? Um, but uh, I, know, I don't wanna be complicit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound like Melville, Melville's Barterby Descriptor. I prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> So good. <laughs> That's good. I'm still, I mean, I'm still harping back to my, uh, just the community part and AD, I'm still feeling that like, what, what are the steps? What are the steps? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, in some ways it, it's a, um, even the way, even the way you describe that with your son, yeah. like, and the influence that you mentioned that each of us have in mm -hmm. the interactions in our spheres of influence and the impact of having those conversations and building that sense of community, even one person at a time, I think is so, so powerful. Yeah. Um, but Absolutely. Then just to, yeah. Go ahead, Go I'm sorry, Doc. No. no, you're good. No, I was just thinking about my son, right? You know, I remember we were in an um, airport when it came, the decision to not charge the police officers who, mm. who killed Tamir Rice. Mm. And I immediately looked back to find my son, 6'2". Mm. He was, a, at the time, you know, um, a D1 prospect for basketball. And I'm looking at him and he's pacing around the airport like a caged panther. And I'm trying to figure out how do I keep this rage from taking root in his spirit? How do I keep, you know, the anger from turning on him? Right. And part of what we, I was trying to do at the time, and I failed miserably on certain levels, was to really to get him to understand himself in relation to others, right? Not to, not to let the anger take root in here, but to really use it as a way to motivate changing the world as such. And again, that, that requires this I-thou relationship, right? That requires to, for him to think of himself in, in more expansive terms and the like. But you know, it was a challenge, Doc, it was a challenge. Because yeah. we both were pacing like pants, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciate your honesty, too, and, and, the, and voicing the challenge and what you had to help him walk through. I mean, I'm thinking of just so many 
folks who, you know, we've been doing that in so many different ways. And I would say the one thing that's been really encouraging in this community idea keeps coming up too, but the way that people were able to not only just internalize it, but to externalize it and to build mm. community with that. Mm. So, you mm. know, even within neuroscience, by the time this airs, this will be a couple of weeks out, but there's a black and neuro event that's been going on mm. that started from one student's tweet mm. a year ago. Now they have 20,000 followers on Twitter. Wow. They've wow. done, you know, 56 events in the last year. And just mm -hmm. the way that they've been able to galvanize a community as students, as trainees, because they took that pain and tried to build something with it rather than just getting stuck in themselves, even though that would be so easy to do, but just not that it's a, it's a solution to everything, but there's been so much that's happened because of that movement. People mm -hmm. who, you know, all the things that happen with people being in predominantly white spaces, feeling like they're the only one that mm -hmm. like people being able to say, oh, I didn't know there was this person here. There's this person here and being able to connect in that way. And just what that has been in terms of just people's day to day, the encouragement they've gotten from that. So I think, you know, that to me, that's been just a great example of seeing the young people just rising up yeah, and that's wonderful. moving forward in the midst of the pain. Yeah, that's so it's, been, it's been an encouragement. Yes, All right, here, here, here you go. I, I got you. First step. You got to know history and know your history. I think that's very important, even down to the fact of I st when I started taking this journey, I started asking my mom, mm. what happened? What was happening to you while you were pregnant with me? Mm. A lot of people don't know those things that and, and I've and I uncovered a key story because my, my life has also been marked by everything just felt like a fight. Though I grew up in Detroit and things were crazy. Everything just felt like a fight. Like, why does everything feel so hard? Mm. And she told me a story recently that shocked my mind. She goes. Well, son, I was waiting to tell you this. You know, when your mom says, mm -hmm. okay, what's she about to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> she says, she, had, she says at the time, medicine wasn't as advanced as it is now. And a doctor turned and said to me, she says, if your son doesn't figure out how to come through this canal, because we can't grab him or we'll kill him. If he doesn't figure out how to come to the, through this canal, you both will die. Think about that. So I go, that makes sense. She says, so you, you, you've had to figure out things with no manual, mm. even before you took your first breath. Mm. Wow. Now wow. that explains a lot. That, so I'm like, thank you for the story, mom. Why you ain't tell me this early, but praise <laughs> God, you know, <laughs> but wow. that, but that, that gives context now to, why life has felt like a struggle, though there's been triumphs. Mm. Those are the stories we need to uncover in our personal lives and our historical lives. I'll give you another just that helped me from <clears throat> Ida B. Wells. When I realized her suffrage, not only trying to get people to understand the tragedy of lynching in the white church, but then the pushback she got in the black church, mm. I go, oh... This helps me understand what we, we would be up against, even in showing people the humanity of truth. Some people are going, yeah, we just want to stay undercover, though. Don't shine the light on the truth because it may affect the thing we're surviving with. Mm. Right. So so those things help. So your history, understand history. And then the last thing I would say that people don't want to do it, you got to do it daily. They don't want to name the things that that pain them. Mm. So that could be in, 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 in a daily thing like, hey, hey, babe, when you said that, that hurt. Hey, son, when you treated me like that in front of other parents, that hurt. I remember I had to have a conversation with my daughter. As, I think she was eight years old. We were at a mm. tennis tournament and I didn't I didn't react, but I pulled it to her side. I said, babe, hey, the way you're treating me, it feels like I'm doing nothing for you as a parent. That mm. hurts. Now, what does that where I come from? No, I had to learn that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that helped her understand that dad is a person in his mm -hmm. emotions. And then that helps her know how to process and flesh out her emotions. Mm. Wow. That's so good. I didn't say I took a lot of bravery on your part, too. Yeah. Indeed. And not be the black pair like, oh, oh, so this is what you got. <laughs> Bring your little, come here. <laughs> Snatch her off the court. That's what we Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's so much teaching that you did in that moment too. Oh, absolutely. For her, just to be yeah. able to, to, to show that example yeah. of the importance of naming it. 
yeah. being able to address it head on. So, yeah. yeah, so good. Well, I'm not leaving much time to talk about the country, <laughs> but I did want I did want to pull that in, you know, just a little bit in terms of, I mean, all the all the things that we've t- brought up that I think are so important. Um, and, and talking about those aspects of community and what we do, staying in our lane, our interaction, spirits of influence. But when it comes to the country as a whole, wh- where where are we in this in this state of denial versus really trying to move things forward? So I know we don't have time to get into all the details, but even all the conversations around critical race theory, which of course is based more in a law school setting, seems to be getting blown up and pushback and all these different types of things. And I've heard you say that, you know, some of the pushback has been an attempt to arrest what we thought was a genuine racial reckoning in this country. Mm. So I'm just curious, you know, as we wrap up, like what your, just what your thoughts are about where we are as a country and what we really need to do to move this forward, as we talked about the personal community, but how do we change where we are as a nation? Well, I think, you know, we're in, in real time experiencing the reassertion of the law. Mm. At every single time, at every single moment, when the nation is on the cusp of fundamentally grappling with the central contradiction that threatens democracy, mm. the nation, white people in particular, double, they double down on the ugliness. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing it in real time right now. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm from the coast of Mississippi, so I know a little bit about hurricanes. Mm-hmm. You know, the front end of a hurricane is very violent, mm-hmm. tears up everything. But then there's the eye. And then you come out, you, the eye allows you to come out and assess the damage. Mm-hmm. But the tail is coming. Mm-hmm. And the tail is as bad as the front end. Mm-hmm. The tail is still coming, y'all. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, at, we're at a crossroads. And I'm not sure if we double down on the ugliness this time, whether or not the nation will survive, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. And what do you, give me, I'm need some thoughts when you say double down on the ugliness the, the idea that this must be a white nation in the vein of old you. europe so they're, they're going to disenfranchise folk they're going to you. you know the at the moment in which we were trying to address policing in the country yeah um passing just something that was really baseline the george mm. floyd Pol- justice and policing act yeah they're already trying to pull back qualified immunity they're trying to gut it and at you. the same time that they're trying to gut it they're now trafficking in the language of the increase in violent crime as a justification to re, to redouble mm. the efforts that led to the carceral state in the first place. Gotcha. So we're in the midst mm. of a reassertion yeah. of a way of being. Um, and the people who are doing it don't give a damn about democracy. So yeah. the two of them, these things converging, mm. I don't know if this place will survive, to be yeah. honest with you, if they yeah. do it. I don't know if we will survive it, to be honest yeah. with you. So no, that's good. You know, it's interesting. You said that because a friend's been on my head to watch this docuseries called uh, How to Become a Dictator, How to Be, how mm-hmm. to be a Dictator mm-hmm. on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And episode one talks exactly about what you're talking about and why dictators rise mm. is because they say what a lot of people actually feel and want. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing it because, you know, people are like, man, how, how is this? And they go, no, it's been there. Mm-hmm. They just needed someone they can get behind. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's where we are. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's that, but, you know, as Baldwin would say, human mm-hmm. beings are miracles and disasters at the mm-hmm. same time. We have to protect ourselves from the disasters that we've become. But if yeah. we show up, if we all show up and risk mm-hmm. everything, there's a chance for a miracle. So. Mm-hmm. We just need to show up. Yeah, and that's good. I mean, I was going to be my next question. Where Do we have hope in the Missouri thing? Yeah, you know, Baldwin, I'm quoting Baldwin again. You know, Jimmy, Jimmy, has, Jimmy has this wonderful line. He says, he has this wonderful line, Doc. He says, hope is invented every day. Mm. And if hope is invented every day, that means you're beating, beating back despair every day. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, we got hope. We got to have hope in us. But mm. We're not mm. naive. It's a blues-soaked hope, Doc. Mm. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll yeah. take it. And to pull yeah. in the psychology and neuroscience again, just because that's who I am. <laughs> Come on, I mean, man, there, there's so much evidence from that. You know, as people, if we just talk about therapy, if people are going through therapy, if they have hope, they're that much more likely to get through and get to a place of healing, maybe not wholeness or complete healing, but to actually be able to move through in that place. And then from a neuroscience perspective, just that expectation 
mm-hmm. what that does to our brains and the way our brains process different situations. So I think that hope is key in a lot of ways. Yeah. And there's, there's so much evidence for that. So it's something that we got to hold on to. Maybe I need to start pulling in Baldwin in some of my, uh, in my neuroscience <laughs> courses too. tie those two together. <laughs> what are you thinking, AD? What do you think? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to default to uh, hope that's tangible and a hope that's honest. And I think in order for us to survive, we have to have an honest hope. Mm. And I, I would agree with, with Eddie that the lie is resurfacing. And sometimes you have the lie of a false hope. Mm. And that's what becomes dangerous. Mm. You know, now, now I'm going to say this as a person of color and, you know, on the heels of reading uh, cast the book, I actually think people who know true oppression know what true hope is. Mm. And in those darkest moments, you'll see those people being the ones that are leaned upon because we actually know our way through the darkness. Mm. Right. So that's, that's the, when I have hope, I go, man, we were born for something. We were born for dark days. Um, And when those dark days come, they're going to come. I hope we are united enough as people to lead the, the, the right way. Some fresh work. Well said. Well said. Well, I appreciate both of you being on here. So much truth and so much richness in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in that short period of time. And <laughs> I'm grateful to both of you. I know this will be a, a blessing to listeners as well. And encourage people to continue wrestling with yeah. these topics and as we all seek to move forward and, into a better place. Thanks again to both of you for jumping on the Addy Hour. Definitely appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you, Doc. Yeah, likewise. Appreciate it.